want to welcome everyone back from lunch. Hope everybody enjoyed lunch today. Yes. And today we have Kent Leslie with Deaconess Cross Point. Um, he's going to be speaking to us today. And Kent's been in the mental health field for 25 years, involved in suicide prevention for approximately 15 years. He is a question, persuade, and refer master trainer and applied suicide intervention skills master trainer, a connect suicide postvention trainer, a yellow ribbon suicide prevention trainer, and an adult and youth mental health first aid instructor. So please join me in welcoming Kent Leslie. Thank you for having me here this afternoon. And really, what I'd like to do is just have a discussion on how we can help um, aging adults in our community or anywhere really to, to make them suicide safer. So, um, you know, and when I re I'm a stand in this afternoon for Janie Chapel, so she's in Chicago. So if anybody sees her, give her a pack for me, please. <laughs> and I said, okay, what's my time slot? She said, you got right after lunch. I said, suicide prevention right after lunch. Well, we know how to warm up a crowd. <laughs> um, Really, I generally, if you feel comfortable raising your hand, um, I generally ask each group that we have a discussion with this question. Um, has anybody known anybody on a first name basis that's either died or attempted to die by suicide? And if you look around the room, that is almost all of us. So here is the scope of the problem in our community. So um, what I would like to do today is really have a discussion, share some of my thoughts. I know some of you in the room, I know there are people here that have already saved lives uh, from against suicide, so just on how we can better serve the, the people that we serve, really, and make them uh, better protect against suicide. So, um, And elderly people or aging adults, whatever term best suits you, um, do have a few different twists on that being risk of dying by suicide, other than, say, some of the younger population. Uh, and I don't know how good my gray might show up. I thought I was going to do something different with this this background slide, and I brought it in here, and I thought, gray, boy, that doesn't show up well at all. But suicide is a public health problem. It is the number one cause of death that is preventable in our country. Um, actually, the second cause of death for adolescents. And if you're a white guy of working age, uh, those are, are the, the people that die the most. And my ripple effect here may not show up very well, but I always generally say, people say, well, I don't want to be involved in suicide prevention, or I don't want to come to training, or it's, it's an uncomfortable subject for me. And I think that is probably the single biggest barrier uh, to helping others. And I generally share my, kind of how I got involved in suicide prevention some 15 years ago. I always say I was voluntold to go to suicide prevention uh, training. I was walking down the hall, and my CEO said, Ken, I was, I was coming to uh, speak with you in your office. I said, oh, you were? It was David Morris at that time. I said, oh, yeah. He said, uh, do you want to become a suicide prevention trainer? And I said, absolutely not. <laughs> and he looked at me and paused, and he said, are you sure? And although I went to public education in Kentucky, I'm not as dumb as I look. <laughs> I said, suicide prevention training. Sure, I've been wanting to do that for a long time. As a matter of fact, I was on my way to your office to ask you if I could go to suicide prevention training. He said, good, because you leave for a week on Thursday. And I was like, I turned around and went, ah, oh, this is going to be awful. I'm going to hate this. I don't want to go learn about suicide. So I went to the training. The first trainer I had was absolutely wonderful. Just, just a wonderful trainer. And I changed my mind during that training. I thought, we really can't help others. If we get over the fear or the uncomfortableness of wanting to be involved and wanting to intervene. Uh, so when I got back from that training, I asked to go to another training. And then when I got that training, I asked them to go to another training. So I asked to get more training and more training. Then I asked to become a master trainer. Then I asked to help train others. And now I'm a coach for other master trainers. And I read something about suicide prevention every day. And I think it, we're going to have to change our culture and our mindset. And if we do that, we really can help others uh, that are at risk of dying by suicide. So, I'm sorry this slide is kind of hard to see, but if we do have an individual death, it does, if you think about that ripple effect or the ecological model 
uh, and a public health model, too. Um, it does affect society, all of society, because we have the individual, then we have peer and family, and those are called survivors, and I'll talk a little bit about terminology and changing the culture of terminology. Um, I think that's part of um, how we protect people better is we, we use different language. You can still find uh, suicide on a dessert menu, suicide by chocolate. Corey and I ate some suicidal hot wings just not too long ago. Um, and we were talking about, as we were eating a hundred of them, how inappropriate they, the language was, call them suicide hot wings. It didn't slow us down on eating, but <laughs> on how we're going to have to change language to be more appropriate to change that culture and how that will set up for saving lives in the future. Um, in their community, too. So really, an individual suicide um, really impact, impacts the whole society. Here's the annual number of deaths. And it's gone up since uh, about 98 or so. So, if you know, people either love stats or hate stats. But I, I like to look at that instead of just looking at a large number. That is 42,773 individuals that were in so much pain that they thought the only way to stop or end that pain was to take their life. So they only had an S plan. So it's kind of our job as people who care about other people to give them a different plan than an S plan. So if you can imagine standing in front of a billboard and the billboard said suicide will take away all your pain. And you couldn't see under that billboard. You couldn't see over that billboard. You couldn't see around it. Then that is your only option. And for all Practical purposes, we do not not know. It, it probably does take away their pain for all practical purposes. We don't know. That. So it's kind of our job to kind of help them see around the billboard, over the billboard, or under the billboard, and see some different ways. Uh, you know, clinicians like to call that constriction, where you can only see one part of, of something. So, uh, and in 2014, the stats are always about three or four years behind. Um, because the CDC is it's the final compilation of that. Actually, it's an IU professor, Dr. John McIntosh. Anybody ever reads any of his stuff or gets a chance to take a, a class from him, he's absolutely excellent. Um, so it's, they're always about three years behind. So new stats come out, they're always higher, unfortunately. So 948 Hoosiers died in 2014. 117 suicides a day. Two Hoosiers die every day. 22 aging adults die every day. Uh, 20 veterans die every day now. It was 22. Uh, but in all suicide prevention training, which I think is a travesty of kind of the way that rates are set, it's always based on quantitative work, not qualitative work. So we talk about suicide rates. So we talk about death rates instead of the number of people uh, that we save or that we intervene with. And there's not an effective now, there's not an effective uh, measure um, of that, I understand there's some research going on on how to measure that, but like I said, we have people in here that I know save lives. I've already saved lives. I know the people from Southwestern, they save lives probably every day. So, um, if we think about quality, just not death rates. 90 men, 27 women. Men are about three or four times as likely to die by suicide. Women are about four times as likely to attempt suicide. Anybody know why more guys die in our country? Somebody said it. In our country, it's guns. Um, in other countries, uh, there are other lethal means that are used or with, uh, that have more restrictive access to firearms. But we always say, if you have somebody in your home that is in crisis, um, that is maybe using drugs and alcohol, really need to limit access to those firearms. That's a difficult sell around here in our area. I live in Western Kentucky. So I always encourage clinicians or people that intervene, uh, whomever it is, uh, that are delivering that suicide prevention first aid, to learn other means restriction. Because um, what do we say? Well, your son, your daughter, your grandfather, your father is at risk of dying by suicide. Do you have firearms at home? Yes. You probably think it's best for you to get the firearms out of the house during crisis time, during this time, till, till they get a little better. And what is the response across the, the desk or table or whomever, the phone to us? 
no, I'm not going to do that. And then our response is, we don't know what else to say after that. So I encourage people that are doing those interventions to learn other means restrictions. Would you consider getting the ammunition out of the house? Would you consider taking the bolts out of the rifles? Would you consider taking firing pins out? Would you consider cable locks? And I am a gun owner, so it's, it's not an anti-gun thing. I'm a hunter. Corey's a hunter. Um, I, I have uh, guns. I actually have multiple guns. You can access my, my long guns only with my fingerprint. I have a biometric safe that works only with my fingerprint. So if you don't put my fingerprint on that safe, that safe will not hold. So encourage clinicians or people that intervene to learn ways to restrict. Does that make sense? Um, and I always say this. This is obviously not a plane, but if this had a, if this was an airplane and had 117 people on board and took off, crashed, everybody died. Next day, 117 people on board, crashed, everybody died. Next day, same thing. Next day, same thing. Next day, same thing. You think we would talk about that? That's the number of deaths from suicide in our country each day. Do we talk about suicide very much? The most uncomfortable subject that people people will skirt around it. I actually call them non-casserole deaths. What happens in our area if somebody dies? We go to the funeral home, we take fried chicken, we take turkey, we take cheese, we take relish trays. People that lose people to suicide don't get that because we're so uncomfortable with the subject, we don't go. And if you think about a death, that has guilt associated with suicide deaths. If somebody loses, has a, a loss in their family member or friends or whatever, there's usually more guilt associated that, with that than there are other deaths. Does that make sense? So they need our more support, probably even more than maybe some other people that lose loved ones. And the bad news really is when people mention suicide, whether they're joking or they're talking about it or they say, um, you know, people be better off without me, or uh, I wish I could go home tonight and go to sleep and not wake up tomorrow. The answer that is most given is silence. We're so uncomfortable with the subject that we don't respond, or we'll say, you're just kidding, right? Because we don't want to hear the answer. Something to think about, especially with aging adults, people consider suicide usually do seek help or make what I call I don't call them warning signs anymore. Um, you know, we, we always talk about warning signs and signs and symptoms. I mean, I think that part of that changing that culture, I call them invitations. They're invitations as people who care about other people to recognize somebody's in distress and needs help. Um, so they send out invitations to us, and we don't ask the question. We don't intervene because it's very difficult for somebody who is at risk of dying by suicide, often to say the word or to directly tell us. Uh, because it's still very much a taboo subject for us. So um, we'll talk about that too. Uh, and people that, that do die by suicide, example here, especially if we're aging adults and aging adult white males. The aging adult white males are the highest per capita uh, rate of people who die by suicide. And if you have a white guy that's above 65, and they have decided to kill themselves, it will be very difficult to change that person's mind. Very difficult. They also, and it's on one of my other slides too, aging adults also have the least amount of diagnosable mental illness at the time of their death by suicide too. So uh, about 90% of the people who die by suicide have a diagnosable mental illness at the time of their death. Aging adults, if you want to use the term rational thought, I mean, it's hard to say that you know, because some people call suicide an irrational act or behavior, but they have, they do not have a history, some of them, of mental illness or something like that before. Yes, ma'am. Do they have, uh, like, chronic medical issues or something like that? Two slides. Okay. You're correct. Okay, sorry. <laughs> number of factors. Number of factors. And the key is asking the question. And people go to the doctor, especially aging adults, they go to the doctor or their medical practitioner um, many times the month before, many times the week before they suicide. So they do not usually um, 
come in there and talk about depression or things like that. They go for somatic complaints or physical complaints. That's why it's so important for all of us to be ambassadors for those individuals that are primary care practitioners or medical practitioners to get them to routinely ask the question, routinely ask the question. For example, we saw my primary care doc not too long ago, uh, whom I went to high school with, and we've known each other for a long time, so we, we had some pretty open, frank dis discussions. And he asked me all kinds of questions about my health. And I said, you didn't ask me if I was at risk of dying by suicide. And he said, well, are you? And I said, no, but you didn't ask. And he said, well, I don't ask everybody. I said, well, maybe you don't think about asking everybody. He and he said, well, we don't. He said, maybe we should. I said, well, if you don't, why not bring you those 200 brochures every month when I come by and see you? He said, it's probably something we should add into our general practice of assessment. So I, he sent me a, uh, I'm not going to say what he said after it. <laughs> when, when he sent me, he sent me the, the assessment that they, cha they changed, and now it's a general question that they ask each time that, that somebody comes into the, uh, their clinic. So asking the question. The key really to, you know, the most direct way to assess somebody's risk of dying by suicide is to ask them. Um, and ask them directly. Are you thinking about killing yourself? Are you thinking about suicide? Some of the latest research says really include that word suicide instead of do you ever wish you were dead, stuff like that. Uh, and there are all kinds of creative ways to ask. Um, but some of the, the latest literature out now really says use the word suicide. Get that word out in the open. Get past that stigma of using that word. Yes, ma'am. So I have a client that has been dealing with chronic pain, like severe pain. And he said, I'm just going to give up. And so I asked him immediately, are you thinking about suicide? And he said, oh, no, I would never. So I did a follow-up call and he also said he was doing fine. He was not thinking of hurting himself. At that point, you just drop it and that they are not. Do you know I, what I mean? Like, sure. It's just I, I, not a very comforting statement that he made. Sure. If, if, I did, if I was doing that intervention and I didn't believe it, I'd probably change the subject and go back to it and just say, you know, I asked you a question a while ago and you said no, but, but you know, there's some collateral information that says you may be thinking about dying. And kind of go into it that way. Well, we did have a discussion and I did follow up with a phone call. And exactly. I felt like he was probably being honest, but yet I, I have no idea sure. what he's thinking. Sure. So you still have a little bit of worry, you know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. And it's uncomfortable. I mean, I've talked to people before and I thought, you know, of course you don't say that to them. It's like, I can't believe you're still a guy. I don't know that I would be. You know, we talk about this X, Y, no support and pain and end of life issues and things like that. And I mean, it's like, I can't believe this poor arsenal. You're doing exactly what you need to do. I would say just don't, just don't give up. Uh, and if you think about it, I mean, really, the, the only person that can keep them alive is themselves. So just keep chipping away and just don't be concerned and um, offer your support. You're doing exactly what you should do. Um, ways that we should not ask, um, which, which we do, which some of us were trained to do many, many years ago. Um, you think about hurting yourself? And that's, that was, I look back at some of our old forms, that's everywhere on our old forms. Because if you think about that, if you, that person is in so much pain that they're thinking in their mindset that if I kill myself, all that pain's going to go away. So they're not thinking about hurting themselves, they're thinking about killing themselves to reduce or eliminate their pain. Also now with suicidal and non-suicidal self-injury, that are you hurting yourself or you think about hurting yourself has a whole different connotation <clears throat> excuse me, than it did you know, 10, 15 years ago. So, and that's why I like to ask, are you engaging in non-suicidal or suicidal self-injury? People engage in non-suicidal self-injury usually because it's a maladaptive stress release or maladaptive coping skill. Some people do engage in self-injury uh, for suicide purposes through the intent of the behaviors to kill themselves. So you want to find out the dynamics behind the behavior and the intent of the behavior. All behavior really is unmet need. So uh, find out why that behavior is occurring. Or we ask ways like, we're well, not gonna do something stupid, are you? I don't feel isolated, alone, and terrible, and you just call me stupid, so I don't really wanna talk to you anymore. Or are you thinking about doing something crazy? Well, everybody wants to get in that line, so you know they won't answer truthfully. 
and honestly. So just ask openly and directly and be prepared for the answer. Uh, anybody ever had to ask anybody? I know that's all the <laughs> so that was kind of a baited question. Um, you know, the, the goal is, some, I mean, I know some of you, so you ask people every day, but the goal is, you know, sometimes people get really comfortable with asking the question, but then if they get a yes, they don't know what to do after that. So we're going to talk about that too. Okay, if you get a yes, you know, don't get up and run out of the room. Oh, no, oh, no. Suicide in late life. Some other things, you know, just kind of think about older adults really are at Aging adults, whatever term you want to use, they really are at, at higher risk than some of the other populations. Um, and 74% of aging adult males use a firearm, and they have a tendency to plan very carefully, so their lethality or their death rate goes way up. Like I said, at least, least amount of diagnosable mental illness at the time of their death. So, really, as far as our intervening, and our intervention process has become more difficult with aging adults. Um, and here's the, really, if you want to look at the stats of aging adults, by the time I'm through talking to you, we'll probably have an adult, aging adult suicide in our uh, country. And of the, uh, the 22 every day, there's 7,693, 65 and above uh, each year in our country. That rate has also gone up since about 98 or 99. They attempt less. There are about 1,500 attempts every day in our country with a cost. Um, sometimes when I go in and talk to businesses, businesses like sometimes don't want to talk about suicide or suicide prevention, so I go in on a um, cost basis. So with the business school, sometimes that helps. So I go in and say, you know, if you have suicide in your company, it's going to cost you this much. And then they'll turn around and say, oh, I didn't realize that. I said, I know. So if you look at people who attempt, the cost is between ten and fifty thousand dollars. That's just for trauma care or emergent, emergency care. That does not include long-term medical care or long-term psychiatric care or any mental health care for that too. So the cost uh, of suicide too for our country is astronomical. It really is. Suicide is always multi-determined. When people say why, why? I mean, what I generally say is, you know, that why died with the person, and it is a maladaptive coping response to an overwhelming stressor or pain in that individual's life that was unique to them. Um, most people don't leave a note. Less than 30% of people leave a note. And usually if somebody leaves a note, um, it doesn't say much, really. I have a whole list of notes in my research, and talk to the families doing that you know that psychological autopsy afterwards and then the notes that they kind of review they don't understand the notes either so um, so we need to involve you know multiple approaches to suicide prevention I, I like to think anybody know what a wagon wheel looks like center of a wagon wheel I like to think about the person whether it's an aging adult person or anybody that's a risk of dying by suicide and we keep adding more spokes on that wheel to surround that person with support that helps the wheel move forward that helps the wheel move forward towards life so um, that way if one of those spokes breaks or is unavailable the rest of those spokes can kind of help help the person keep going does that make sense all right and most most suicidal persons want to find a way to live if you think about uncertainty or sometimes uh, suicidologists use the words ambivalence they have a, a life side and a death side so they're, they're struggling with each other. So we're trying to find a way to keep them uh, alive. Now, where I think that becomes particularly difficult uh, is aging adults, you know, end of life issues. I did training for um, uh, a hospice group not too long ago, and it was, when you think about that, I mean, it was, it's very difficult to find those future life changing things or to motivate an individual to have hope during those end of life issues. Uh, but we, it was a good training. It was a, there were a good group of people. Um, reduce risk factors and redu re reduce risk. Enhance protective factors. I can't talk this afternoon. And you reduce risk. I like to think of those as um, a wall of protection factors. So 
I always want that ball twice as high, twice as deep as the things that are um, causing stress or pain in their lives. That will protect us. And sobriety is always the, the, uh, the base of the wall. When I, do, when I do this training with youth or a version of this training with youth, we'll take eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper and we'll build us a wall. You know, what houses? Play a PlayStation. Play a PlayStation. I love playing PlayStation. Okay, what, what's something that stresses us out? Mom and Dad getting on my nerves. And then we'll build that wall. That wall always has to be twice as high and twice as thick as the things that stress us out. And that's learning those resiliency skills, teaching coping skills, and things like that. Why suicide? Depression. Depression, number one killer, all age groups, really. Um, and especially in aging adults, if you look if, if you look at depressive disorders, bipolar depression is by far the number one killer. Outside of depressive disorders, like a mental illness or other mental illness here down at the bottom, um, anxiety disorders are um, the number one diagnosed mental illness in our country. 20% of the population has a diagnosable anxiety disorder. And if you look at that, people that are way, way down on the list are individuals that are living with or um, diagnosed with schizophrenia. We're all about twice as likely in this room, twice as likely to kill ourselves as somebody really that has a diagnosis of schizophrenia. If, especially if that condition is not chronic and if they have support. So, substance abuse, and um, I mean, we all know that substance abuse in aging adults, um, I mean, they're substance abusers. It's, uh, that was something until we had an aging adult unit years ago, I just really didn't think about that much. And they can, you know, they act out in ways that uh, sometimes to me are hilarious too. So they can be pretty feisty sometimes too. Um, and and if loss, you talked about, you know, somebody losing somebody, chronic illness, pain, I mean, those things are very disabling. I'm going through a personal experience uh, now with a, a relative of mine who has um, chronic illness, uncontrollable pain, they're 83, um, and just, you know, you think about they think about dying every day. Now, she's not at the uh, point yet where she's thinking about taking her own life, but, you know, where do you, I think it could get that way if, if some things don't change. Uh, social isolation and loneliness, changing uh, roles, retirement, losing friends, staying alone at home, not having that social connectedness, which I think is, for aging adults, really, if we can get them involved in stuff, that connectedness, not uh, feeling like they're a part of something, not a burden, and it really, really can help. And just a series of frustrating life events. And mental illness or past mental illness. And if you look at those individuals who did not have mental illness that died by suicide, then usually they have uh, a history of like not the best coping skills, not the best uh, communicative skills. Um, so we can look for patterns like that too, or mental illness in their family. Etc. And males, uh, you know, sometimes males act out. So they're, when they're depressed, they may be irritable and cuss people out. And it can even become abusive at times. Because what's the only emotion, really, that we're encouraged to show all the time from the time we are small? Um, and we're actually encouraged to show it is, you know, being aggressive or being angry. And that's encouraged many times. So um, part of that, you know, teaching individuals, males especially, to get in touch with other emotions because we act out uh, that way when our feelings are hurt, when we're embarrassed, when we're lonely, when we're sad. So they're, they're more likely to turn to substances um, than females during that time frame. Anybody ever heard of Scheidman? It's really the father of suicidology. He has some wonderful books too that are referenced in this PowerPoint. So here are some commonalities of those that died by suicide. He turned the coin psyche, which is really just, you know, people that have emotional pain or physical pain, really, that is, you know, they just can't bear. It's unendurable. A lot of times we know about physical pain, and it's pretty much for us to get a, a mindset about physical pain, but a lot of us can't really kind of get into that. I don't understand that emotional pain being so great. So I kind of parallel it with, if I had a vice, if I know what a vice is, Bolted to this table, and I said, okay, can I get somebody to uh, come up here and stick your hand in that vice? I'm going to crank it down until you kill yourself. 
First of all, would anybody volunteer? I didn't think so. Uh, and people don't volunteer to get depression. They don't volunteer to get mental illness. They don't volunteer really to be at risk of dying by, by suicide. So I came up here and I said, so I chose someone. And put their hand in there and started cranking it down. I said, does it hurt? I said, yeah. Well, are you going to kill yourself? No, I'm not. And if you think about those individuals that are in that pain, whether it's physical or emotional, they resist killing themselves for long periods of time, most of them, until the pain gets so great. So if I kept cranking that down and said the only way that that pain will stop is if you kill yourself, eventually how many of us would say, I want that pain to stop no matter what? And if I have to take my own life, um, there's no other way to reduce that pain, I will take my own life. So if you think about that, kind of parallel that emotional pain, which I do believe is just as great, um, with physical pain, then that's why people choose to stop that pain. Frustrated uh, psychological needs and that seeking a solution, that common person, uh, solution, excuse me, that is a solution to end the pain or for that pain to stop. Um, that's why I like the wall of resistance. I always like to know what helps when that pain is so great. And I ask people to write it down. Just, just write it down. Or I have a, a phone app that I think is really great. And there's some new safety planning now by Dr. Greg Brown and Colin Carpenter that's just excellent. I have a My3 app on my phone that's, you know, we're all, maybe not aging adults as much, but we're all, you know, by our phones all the time. And it can help. Or not, have them write it down. And you want pro-social stuff, not maladaptive stuff that helps ease the pain. So somebody say, well, yeah, if I take two Xanax and drink a half a bit, it really helps out. <laughs> uh, and you might say, well, yes, it, uh, I bet it does. I bet it helps you sleep or enjoy it. We need to find something that makes you feel just as good that is pro-social and replace that, that maladaptive behavior. Does that make sense? And hopelessness and helplessness, I mean, without hope, um, anybody ever read Victor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning? I mean, he talks about hope. and It's an old book. I have a copy somewhere in my library. But uh, it is it's amazing. It, yeah. It, you, Frankl lost all of his members in the family um, during the Holocaust in the camp. So he was a psychiatrist. So he was kept alive so he could help treat uh, individuals in the camp. And it's a, not an entertaining read, but it is, uh, uh, it is worth reading. And he talks about assessing hopelessness and helplessness and how people go through suffering and people handle it differently. And there's that uncertainty or ambivalence, um, you know, teetering between life and death, um, and which one will kind of win out. Uh, there's constriction, so the billboard example I gave, um, and aggression or escape. I just want to escape this pain. Um, and sometimes people have lifelong difficulties with communication skills or problem solving skills. There's those invitations. So if we have some of this stuff going on and then we have a situational uh, clue where somebody's diagnosed with a terminal illness or has a lot of pain or gets in a car wreck or loses their, um, their place to live, something like that, or their place in an environment where they're being abused or they have to go from, uh, in their mind, a very safe place like home to another place that they feel is not safe. Verbal clues. Men have a tendency to be real direct with their verbal clues, um, and females have a tendency to be less than direct. That's why it's so important to ask the question. Um, some people, like an uh, example me, I just want out. What do you want out of? You want out of math class? You want out of your marriage? Would you like that? You want out of assisted living? Uh, or do you want out of life? So, that's why we have to drill down and keep asking those questions. Um, and some people will just say, you know, don't worry about me. Don't have to worry about me anymore. Um, or I'm fine with it. Things like that. So that's where we drill down and ask those questions to find the dynamics behind the behavior. And we all should learn um, depressive symptoms. You know, if you look at what you know, mental illness or mental health crises do, and, you know, probably say that instead of mental illness does to our society as far as just you know hurts our children and hurts our workforce it you know it's devastating to our aging adults we all should learn better how to intervene with those people that may be showing those signs and symptoms i get shirts to say are you okay friends ask 
And it doesn't have to use, you know, you don't have to use clinical language. You just have to care about other people. I think as a nation, I control that. We're becoming less civil to each other. Now, I have some my own theories of that too. That you know, we don't seem to care about each other as much as we used to. And, and then behavioral clues. Learn those behavioral clues too. Somebody showing those uh, signs and symptoms. And here's just a couple of things about. I, I think I've mentioned already. Um, women more likely to have you know feelings of sadness, worthlessness, and, and guilt. And men may or may or may not, but more likely to act out overtly, be irritable, tired, um, lose pleasure in activities that they used to, and they may become um, a little more verbally aggressive. And I think sometimes, unfortunately, that hurts our intervening with them because they become a little more standoffish. Those are kind of the people that I like to, I should say, that's kind of like the best. Um, I, I think of a, when we had our aging adult unit, I just share this story. Um, we had a, a lady there, we'll just call her Mrs. Smith. And I always say, focus on the person, not the task. Focus on the person, not the task. They couldn't even give Mrs. Smith ADLs because she was pretty difficult. So um, they called me one day and they said, hey, Mr. Trainer, come down here and show us your skills. I was like, oh gosh, I'm going to look like a moron in front of these people when Mrs. Smith puts me in a headlock. But <laughs> So I go down there and I walk on the unit. They're just trying to get Mrs. Smith's blood pressure. I walk on the unit and she said, nag, nag, nag. That's all you SOBs do around here. And at first I thought, well, I'm going to like her. <laughs> She's my kind of person. So I went over and talked to her and I said, Mrs. Smith, she said, what the hell do you want? <laughs> I said, can I sit down and talk to you for a minute? And she said, I don't care. So I sat down and talked to her because I wasn't really focused on taking her blood pressure. What I was focused on was Mrs. Smith. So I said, I just want to sit down and talk to you. Wonderful mind. I mean, just an amazing person. Escaped Hitler when she was about 12 or 13. She lived in Poland. Became a nurse when she was 16 years of age in London and helped victims of the bomb. Uh, bombings in that and just had a wonderful rich life that we had never gotten to because all we were worried about was taking our blood pressure. So I, I said, so tell me more. Tell me more. I said, hey, by the way, stick out your arm there. Uh, they're going to they're gonna do something to your arm. I think they're going to take your blood pressure. She stuck it out. I was so impressed with Mrs. Smith that I went back and had my lunch with her every day for the next three weeks. And it was like, it was like taking a, a course in life me. What a wonderful, I hated to, you know, I hated to see her go. Don't tell, don't tell our people that, but I hated to see her leave. She was just such a wonderful, rich person that we never got to because we were focusing on tasks instead of people. So um, I always say focus on the person, not the task. Uh, we've talked about that too already. And there's the reference for that too. Um, mass depression in, in the elderly, especially uh, males. Some of these are, are really kind of for males. Weight loss, somatic complaints. Hopelessness, we've talked about that. Memory complaints with or without signs of cognitive impairment. Um, and the loss of, of feelings of, of, you know, the pleasurable activities that they used to like to do. And lack of interest in personal care and irritability. What can we do? We should never assume that it's a physical illness because of the person's uh, behavior. We should always try to see, do a full assessment of physical illness, plus a mental health assessment too. Uh, and if anybody says they're becoming a burden, anybody, a burden to others, that should automatically, we should automatically ask the question. Whether they're, you know, most of the time we think about aging adults, and the literature says aging adults feel like that more, but you take a 10 year old whose mother and father are going through a divorce, uh, feels like he's the cause of the divorce, or she's the cause of the divorce, had some difficulty in school, maybe some perceived bullying, and that 10 year old's uh, pet dies. That's a recipe for disaster. So not just think about uh, aging adults, but all ages. And we should always promote emotional health. I mean, I think we do a really good job. I have, a, you know, the opportunity to kind of go around to other places all the time because of the nature of the job that I do. I think here in, in our general area, we do a really good job in behavioral health. I think there are more adult or aging adult services here. The people that generally care about the people they serve than other places too. And those social connections. Uh, and I'll use a personal example there. My dad 
my mom died a few years ago. My dad was a workaholic. He retired. They were going to go on a six-month vacation. Uh, my mom had a sore throat. She said, well, i got to go to the doctor before we go on this vacation for six months. She comes back from the doctor, has to see a specialist. She has uh, stage four throat cancer. She died a few months later. But so they've been saving their whole life, you know, doing this. They're going to go travel the world now. My dad had just retired, workaholic, and so he's lost. I actually had to ask him the question. Um, sitting in our kitchen, or his kitchen, he was still crying this months after my mom died. And I said, I've got to ask my dad. He's thinking about killing himself. One of the hardest things I've ever done, and having literally probably thousands of hours of suicide prevention training before that. So after I exhausted everything under the sun to talk about, I asked him, and he was laying there, he was sitting there crying, he had his head in his hand, and he said, he raised his, raised his head up, and he said, no, son, but thank you for asking. And I was like, wow, this stuff really does work. All that training I've had, all that training I've had, it really does work. But he didn't have any social connections because he had worked his whole life. So he went through a period of time before he got those, and then when he got them, I called him the grumpy old man, uh, then he was, he, I mean, his mood was so much better. I mean, his, his health improved. It was just, it was amazing. Um, you know, they played golf, poker. And it was really a, a group of men who had lost their wives, really. So they had that connectedness and that and social connectedness. Uh, protective factors and some more. We always, uh, you know, should always encourage people talking about their mental health and receiving care for their mental health and their, um, their uh, emotional problems, too. And I think skills, teaching skills are to adapt people to change. And if you look at any population that, that really where cultural beliefs or religious beliefs have the most influence on keeping people alive, it's aging adults. Anybody have any questions? I know we're rambling on. We can we can send Corey over there and he scares a lot of people. <laughs> Even in that Easter egg color shirt he's got on. I'm just kidding. Are you happy? can you hear me in the back? Nobody ever reports it. Says I'm too not uh, too soft, so I'll try to speak up too. Um, and learning being ambassadors to help people when they um, you know when they have depressive symptoms. I think what helps most if you look at community health models, whether it's mental health or public health, is informing the public uh, and for the public not to be afraid to intervene. Not to be afraid to intervene. You may ever heard of Kevin Hines. Kevin Hines was a, a, a young man who was uh, diagnosed with bipolar depression who actually jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge when he was 22 years of age. Went to the bridge and he said if one person asked him, one person, you know, what was going on that day, he was not going to jump, and nobody asked. So we have a tendency not to want to get involved. So I think we're going to have to get over that, for mental health especially, and kind of help people along. And we're going to have to learn that aging adults do misuse their medication. They do uh, misuse alcohol sometimes. So, and how to effectively intervene with those specific aging adult populations. And increase access to care, which I think... Our area probably does not have a, a problem as much as some other areas. We have some good aging adult care in our area. And I, I'm getting more familiar with that now because of the, the person I've involved. I've been very impressed with uh, the care that she's received in, in multiple places. So here's some plans. We should always have uh, a plan to intervene. And here's just an example of one. Um, and I hope everybody can see this. But... This is what I call the CPR++ model. There are some other ones that are, this is just an example, that are really, really good. Um, so if you have somebody at risk of dying by suicide, even if, if they're just having thoughts, say they're just having thoughts but they don't have a plan, and that would be the second thing I would ask uh, after you ask them, are you thinking about killing yourself? And then how would you do that? Uh, and just listen to the plan. The more detailed the plan is, uh, the more likely it is, the higher risk they are. Um, another thing that we should do that's difficult for caregivers especially is we always want to go straight to the reasons why they want to live or should want to live. Thematically, at that time, they are not there yet. 
So just listen to their suicide story. I kind of call that, if you think about an emotional volcano, and now all that pain kind of flowing out. And if you think about a volcano, if we try to stop lava, what will happen to us? It will burn us. But if you let that lava flow out, cool off, then we can mold that lava into something positive. So um, it's kind of human nature that we want to So you know, your kids or your family or, or whatever, and they're just not there yet. They're still thinking about the, the pain, the past, and death until we can kind of, you know, get them to that point. I call that wading through the garbage. You got to wade through the garbage sometimes to get clean. Um, so they're just having thoughts. You want an agreement from them to keep safe. How long can you do that? Um, also, safety contacts. Uh, who can you call? Uh, they can be informal. They can be formal. Informal's Uncle Bob and Betty. Uh, formal is you know could be nine one one. Could be law enforcement. Could be the National Suicide uh, Prevention Hotline, which I encourage everybody just to put in their cell phones. 800-273-TALK. 800-273-TALK. The mnemonic for that is 8255. One, press one for veterans, too, in that line. Uh, safe, no use, drugs and their alcohol. And the reason why we say safe or no use, safe use instead of no sometimes, is if somebody's you know drinking um half a fifth vodka a day or a fifth vodka a day and you tell them not to drink, first of all, is it realistic? No, it's not realistic. And it can actually put them into some medical emergency type of stuff too. So you might want to ask them not to drink alone uh, or not to consume over the amount that they normally consume, even though that sometimes that's a, a large amount. Uh, and then a relink to resources. And if somebody's having thoughts, then you may kind of be okay with that. I also would always, always encourage them to see a professional. I would, but you know, that, that's automatic for me. Uh, if they have a plan, what is the current plan? How are you going to do it? How prepared? When is it? Is it soon? Is it going to be today? Is it going to be tomorrow? Is it a month from now? Aging adults will plan very specifically most of the time and will act on that very specifically and very quickly using it. Uh, is the pain unbearable at times? And I almost... I always ask, you know, if you're going to disable that plan, what helps? What helps ease that pain? Do you feel safe? Do you have any resources? Is there anybody you talk to? Then informal versus formal. There's background factors there that I call plus plus, prior suicidal behavior. Um, the single most factor that people will kind of invitation, that people have prior attempts, that they will attempt again, although most people do die on their first attempt. And I actually added another one too. Mental health. Have you received mental health treatment before? And the other plus I add substance abuse treatment. Have they received substance abuse treatment? So, and if they've attempted before, what kept them alive after that? Kevin Hines said, he, Kevin Hines jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge, 895 feet down, lived. And he said, of oh, this 10 or so people that have lived, out of the almost 2,000 that have jumped off the bridge, he said, nobody climbed up and jumped again. So what kept them alive after that? And if people have attempted before, what survival skill has kept them going up until now? And then why suicide? Why now? What has exhausted now when they think death is the only way out? Does that make sense? All right. How am I doing on time? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, go ahead, please. Um, so what resources are available to those who say that they, are, they don't have enough money to see a professional? Well, you can always take them to, like, call 911 or take them to an emergency department. Ability to pay if somebody's actively suicidal is not a reason to uh, not give care. Anytime. Anytime. If somebody tells you that it is, they're not telling you the truth. So. Uh, and I would also encourage people post mention, learn about after this suicide occurs, how can we continue to help save lives? So postvention really is prevention. So we have a hope team that uh, we have. Larry has some cards at our booth, and what it is is we have we actually have the phone with us today. In our community, we have a hope team that has multiple members on it. If somebody dies by suicide, we go to the scene um, and help support the family. So it, you know the goal of that is to help save other lives. 
and get those people into uh, the support they need, whether it's an SLS group, mental health treatment, substance abuse treatment, what, whatever it is, and reduce that contagion effect. <clears throat> also, safe messaging. We not glorify, glamorize. Uh, suicide would be the front page of the news, or uh, you know, if you look at some of the messaging around Robin Williams, I mean, then we saw a spike in suicides in our in our country after that because you know of the unsafe messaging that's put out by the media because it sells papers and sells um, you know it's people to change channels, turn on the TVs, etc. I've got a picture in my office of Robin Williams. It says. Uh, the public's view of Robin Williams, and you're standing on top of the world, you know, the globe, and it said Robin Williams' image of himself. He's under the globe, and the globe is crushing him. So we never know what's going on in somebody's mind. So, uh, you know, we need to drill down past that. And that's what it is. Reduce contagion, copycat, um, things like that, just because uh, it helps save other lives. Um, and another thing, we can accept all feelings. Um, and if somebody's lost somebody, I think a lot of times we try to uh, take away that person's suicide, grief, pain so quickly and we don't want to talk about it. One of our survivors that goes out and talks with us lost her brother. She said it was eight years before anybody mentioned her brother's name after he died of suicide. Eight years. And that was including inside and outside the family. So we have to be able to, to process through that, talk about loved ones. Talk about that they died by suicide and how we can help keep other people alive and not uh, shame and blame and bury that, uh, that behavior. Um, and, and healing will take a long time. All, I think all healing takes a long time, especially if it's a death. Um, you know, we're supposed to do three days of bereavement to go right back to work. And to, I would say my father, my father and I were very close. It was probably a year before I could really function that in that year after his death, was, everything's like a little fuzzy still. It's like people say, well, we did that. It was like, I don't remember doing that. So, uh, and be patient and understanding. And I really, really do think we need to help support those people um, that lose others to suicide. And talk about suicide, some of the, the uh, words that I said about changing language. Uh, a couple of the words that they're trying to change are... Uh, Commit. You know, what do you think about when people commit stuff? I think sins and crimes. So, to me, suicide is neither one of those. Um, unsuccessful and successful. Could you imagine telling somebody you made an unsuccessful attempt to end your life? And how insensitive that is. Or they successfully killed themselves. Well, there's nothing successful about suicide to me. So. Some of the new terms, um, suicide, suicided, uh, suicide is a verb, some of the, because it is a behavior. I usually say died by suicide or completed suicide. That's just what I'm more comfortable with. So just, and that's less important than being involved. But, you know, just some of that's how we move forward, I think. Uh, there's the suicide prevention hotline. The, we also have a local one, Southwestern has, too. Um, and you get a local person there, you get a live person, which I think is awesome. And then a friendship line, I did a little uh, research on this, which I thought was extremely interesting. Aging adults are less, they're of any population, are less likely to call a suicide or any type of help line. So they have one now called the friendship line. And this is, it's put on by the Institute of Aging, uh, and it's a 24-hour line, and it, it those individuals that are at risk of dying by suicide, or they just need a friend. You know, most, I mean, just somebody to talk to, because most prevention lines, suicide prevention lines, hotlines, if you're not at risk of dying by suicide, they will try to, you know, put you somewhere else pretty quick. So this one you can just call and talk to. So that's, that's pretty cool. And I just think when you intervene, you plant the seeds of hope, and, you know, that's what really we're trying to do. And here's some reading that I think is great. Uh, Dr. Paul Monette, he actually uh, started the QPR Institute. So those two books are written by him. Uh, Dr. Sean Shea, Art of Suicide Assessments, great. Um, 
Dr. Scheidman, Suicidal Mind, Night Falls Fast is a wonderful uh, book. Kay Jameson is a professor of psychiatry at Johns Hopkins University. She also is diagnosed with bipolar and has attempted to kill herself on more than one occasion. She also has a, I don't know if I put it up here, um, another book called An Unquiet Mind, which is excellent too. Um, Why People Die by Suicide, Man's Search for Meaning. My Son, My Son by Iris Bolton, who, uh, Iris Bolton's uh, son killed uh, himself when he was, I think when he was a, a late teenager. It's just wonderful about grief and loss. I have uh, electronic copies of that too, and uh, so if anybody wants that, I can send that to you electronically. We also have hard copies too that we give away for the home too. Uh, Real Men Do Cry for the sports fans in the room. Eric Hipple played for the uh, Detroit Lions. In the 1980s, he was a tremendous athlete. <clears throat> the Lions were absolutely terrible in the 80s because that's when I was, you know, it's when I grew up, child of the 80s. Um, Eric jumped out of a car doing about 85, 90 miles an hour in an attempt to kill himself. His 16 year old son did use Eric's uh, shotgun to shoot himself in the chest in Eric's home. Um, so it's an, it's an easy read, it's an entertaining read too because it's got some funny stories. It also talks about men and depression and how to get men to see uh, our access treatment. Uh, and Crack Not Bo Broken by Kevin Hines is also an excellent read, too. I have um, copies of that book also, uh, if anybody would like it, too. Then there are my resources. They're, they're really easy to read, aren't they? I think they're in there. But I'll entertain any questions. Be glad to. And any questions or our comments, too. Anything at all. Nobody actually fell asleep, so thank you all very much. Yeah. Anybody have any questions? Anything? We also, I guess I should say. Is that on? Uh, can we go online and get this kind of point? Or not? It wasn't as of Wednesday when I'm I, Since I was an add on, I don't know, because Danny was supposed to do this. If not, you my. Well, let me oh, know. well, thank you. <laughs> There's my contact information. I'll send it to you. Be glad to. Be, it, it's a. Uh, it's kent.lesley at deaconess.com, and that's my direct line in my office. But, yeah, you're more than willing to have any of the stuff that I have. So We also do suicide prevention training, several of those things that I talk about at no cost. So if you want your organization to train, we'll come train you. We'll be happy to kind of share the discussion on how we can help others uh, and protect them from suicide risk. So thank you for your time and attention. Let me know if you need it.
think is key to helping vets is getting other vets involved in that have gone to, to get help for their post-traumatic stress or their uh, you know their difficulties, and then vets like to talk to vets. Mm -hmm. And so if you can if you can find them like Point Man, have you ever heard of Point Man? Mm -hmm. Point Man. Just write it down. I don't know if I have their copy. You can just write on a uh, suicide prevention brochure on this wall. Okay. It is out of here the back. It's a. Uh, it, and I've got a pen right here. Right here. I would write it, but you won't be able to read my writing. <laughs> <laughs>